Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, and my partner in crime, Aaron Quinn. It's kind of a weird week. There's a lot of news and very little of it has to do with the football game being played on Sunday. Yeah, and I did no homework because I don't care about this matchup at all. It's just a free week. <laughs> I didn't have to do any homework for the matchup. I'm just I'm just ready to coast, hopefully healthy into the playoffs, man. Yeah, I did debate for a second finding one of our Dolphins friends to come on the show just to kind of make fun of him a little bit, but <laughs> I would have gloated for I, a yeah, few minutes. You know, we we could have just kind of gloated and had some fun for a minute, but I decided that it wasn't worth the, the time or energy. So um as we get into it tonight's show is brought to you by our presenting sponsor, Uncle Jumbos, and we'll get into our, our sponsor segments between them and West her later on in the show um you know to start there's a, a lot of things we'll talk about the uh Kenny Stills news and some of the minor ones with uh you know Greg Jennings and, and other guys on the practice squad we'll talk a little bit about the really awesome news for many of the Bills fans the season ticket holders so we're going to have uh fans allowed in the stands we'll talk a little bit about the different playoff scenarios of things to watch for this weekend and and whether Aaron and I feel strongly about a certain opponent or or a certain matchup. And we'll talk a little bit about the game itself in in going into this Bills and Dolphins game. So probably more content than we planned on having in in a week like this. Um, But let's start with uh, a couple of the bigger picture items here. So one of the news items that came out today, Adam Schefter uh, dropping a normal Schefter bomb here. There was a handful of different players out there. Um, so Snacks Harrison, Damon Harrison, got uh, claimed in, uh, on waivers by the Packers. That was a name that many people were paying attention to. And one of the other ones that came out here was Kenny Stills. So it's been reported that Kenny Stills is going through COVID protocol to be able to be tested, to be eligible to sign with the Buffalo Bills. Um Obviously, a more of a deep threat receiver overall plays a fair amount out of the slot and outside, pretty versatile. Most of his background has been with the Texans and the Dolphins, a couple different stops, and is obviously much much better than the standard street free agent that normally would be available at this time of year. He asked for his release from the Texans because his contract was going to be up, and wanted to catch on with a contender. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of what I think it means for the injuries, but just what were your first thoughts when you saw that news come across with Kenny Stills uh, joining the team? Yeah, I wanted it as soon as he was re- asked for his release and got his yeah. release from the Texans. Um, I don't, I don't love the speculation. I tweeted that out. That I don't love where people immediately go to that it's got to be bad news. I mean. Obviously, Beasley's week to week. We heard it from McDermott. Week to week is a lot different than when he says day to day, right? Like we we can assume we won't see Cole Beasley this week, and there's a good chance that he's possibly not going to be available for a wild card game. But I don't know that they are panicking on that to bring in Stills. I think either way, they were going to bring in a guy like Stills, especially after the news broke about the amount of practice squad uh, lifting the amount that you can bring up. Uh, with COVID and into the playoffs. So I think anytime you can get better, and this is something Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott have just talked about with their entire time here. Anytime you have an opportunity to make your team better and load up a little bit here before a playoff run, you do that. You just go in and you load up. And I think a lot of people wanted this uh, move to happen a long time ago. And, and now's a great time. And for stills, it makes perfect sense to sit out a couple weeks, recover. I'm sure that he had some dings up from playing and then you pick your poison. I'm sure the Bills were not the only team in on conversations nope. with him. I would guarantee, almost guarantee you the Packers would have liked to have brought him in here going into the playoffs. And so whether or not there's speculation on the other end of this with some type of injury to, to, uh, to Beasley or something going on with Brown, I don't know. But I do know that it's just a benefit to the Buffalo Bills to get a guy that has real reps inside and outside, can do a little bit of everything. He's not going to be blow the top off he's not going to be a game changer in any way but this just adds depth to a position on an offense that's a prolific passing offense if something does happen or cole's not able to go you have better depth like this is a in my opinion if it does go down and the way that tweet was worded it sounds like it side they're leaning towards that signing happening i'm all for it i i see no downside yeah i, I think you're spot on and it's it's a combination of things. So Stills, obviously, he's he's not 
a Stefan Diggs, Cole Beasley, John Brown level player right now, he's better than the Jake Kumros and the Duke Williams and the Greg Jennings of the world. Like he's an NFL caliber rotation level player. You mentioned the Packers. His former home, the Miami Dolphins, are without a ton of their receivers. They would have loved to have a player like him back to try to make a playoff run here. Uh, He had plenty of options. Um, His previous destinations in Houston and in Miami are both Earhart Perkins systems. So he's going to be very familiar with the route tree that's asked of him, the terminology, the play calls. Obviously, he doesn't have any chemistry or timing with Josh, so he's going to have a little bit of time to talk this week. They can do virtual meetings this week. Um, and then next week, obviously, if it's official, he could practice and, and be able to actually physically do some things. So being able to go through that kind of thing, I think you're adding a guy that um, I think you you laid it out well. And you, you know, between you and I and Eric, we talked a bit earlier. Some people are trying to really pick or choose. Oh, what does this mean? Because he's a John Brown or he's a Cole Beasley. He's honestly like a pretty decent mix of both. He's not as good in the short area as Cole Beasley is in the uh, short area slot. He's probably more of a true deep threat or what John Brown was previously. Maybe John Brown has a little more nuance to, to his game. He's a nice mix of both, but he can do some different things that both of them do and could play out of the slot if needed. For all the fans who immediately said, oh, this means something terrible about Cole Beasley, I think you said it really well that this is smart, proactive insurance. Let's say that both John Brown and Cole Beasley are healthy and ready to play immediately for the first playoff game. They just came back from injuries. What if they get re-injured and then all of a sudden you're SOL because you don't have anybody who can fill in and do that. All of a sudden, now you have an active insurance policy on the roster, ready to go on game day. Not somebody you have to scramble and try to get in for workouts or to get through a COVID protocol. You have somebody there ready to go right now. So... I love the fact that they add somebody of this caliber that now if we were to have an unfortunate injury there, now you have somebody NFL caliber stepping in, not pinning your hopes on a practice squad you know, story that you're hoping pans out. So um, I love this move. I wanted him just like you did from the moment that he got released. He's a great fit in this setup and having a guy who is legitimately a high-end deep threat still i think he still has that in his arsenal uh to pair with josh allen that's fun yeah and the thing i think a lot of us have to think about and it's it's hard because this is very new territory for bills fans is (laughs) this playoffs isn't about one and done and i don't think that's the mindset of the gm or the coaches or the players going into this it there's a chance this could be another month of football four games to get to the super bowl that's a lot of football to be played. If you look at, if you break the season down and you look at that month of November, that felt like forever or for uh, October, that felt like forever. If you look at the fun streak, they just went on uh, that felt like forever. And a lot of things happened in between those games, guys getting dinged up. So it's not even just about if Cole and John Brown can't go wild card weekend. It's what happens if somebody does go down over the next month, possibly of football that the drop off isn't to Isaiah McKenzie starting. Right, the drop off is to Kenny Stills coming in, a guy that's played receiver, had success, has had production as a receiver against real NFL defensive backs. That stuff matters when you're going into the playoffs and deep into the playoffs versus throwing. I, I like Isaiah McKenzie. I like his role in this offense. I don't necessarily want him lining up at receiver and running routes and, and being a guy that we're going to have to lean on for some production to keep the ball moving. You know what I mean? That's that's where I'm at with Stills. Yeah, he's a bonus. He, he's a bonus from that standpoint. Kevin asking here, how does the signing affect salary cap? Actually, several folks chimed in here that it's prorated. Um, he'd get a, a week 17 game check. This is accurate. Um, the playoff payouts are from playoff revenue. So any playoff payouts don't impact the salary cap. You don't get penalized because you go further in the playoffs and have to pay players more of that. That gets paid out from the the playoff mm-hmm. money. Um, so he'll get one game check. He'll cost. As a matter of fact, to be completely honest, if he signs after week 17, I don't know that he technically counts. Is <laughs> I'm really curious. I'm going to have to research that. If he doesn't get a regular season game check, I don't for sure know how that counts, if anything, but I'm going to assume it's one game checks worth of, of that. So roughly $60,000 he's going to cost for the, the salary cap. So um, I will, he is just stored on the practice squad. Correct. And never sees the field. Correct. Right? And then, 
if Beasley and Brown are both 100% good and back and ready to go and that they feel confident in them playing, he may only be an insurance policy, but he's an awful nice one to have. Absolutely. Um, you also saw some news. Greg Jennings signed uh, West Virginia second-year receiver, signed to the practice squad. Taylor Gentry, former Wyoming receiver, uh, connected to jo- Josh Allen, also brought in for a workout. Um, obviously, when you have two of your top three targets dinged up to some capacity, you're going to kick the tires on guys. That's what we're seeing right now. This is smart. This is just good, proactive game planning. I don't think it means anything doom and gloom. It just means they're being smart and proactive. I actually thought Gentry would get a look earlier, like a sure. game this summer. I think he's a good practice squad guy to have around. Buddy of Josh's had successor Josh in college. So it just made sense to me. So seeing his name didn't surprise me. But again, nothing was alerting my, uh, you know, oh, shit, something's really wrong. Yeah. Bell, these are guys that they lost Kumro uh, by yeah. making that move for Brown. They lost him. I'm not sure that they thought they were going to lose him or not, but they did. Yeah. And they're kind of trying probably to fill that final spot. B loves tinkering with that end of the roster, <laughs> two to three spots. So I expect a bunch of types of tryouts and stuff here yeah. uh, as the season wraps up. I'll even say there's a non-zero chance that these things lead into next year. I think that yeah. I de- that's how I describe Greg Jennings. I think he's a perfect futures contract. You see those announced here coming up in a couple weeks. He's there's a good a, right around the same time we got Eddie Yarbrough four yep. years ago or whatever. Yeah, it's a great call. That's a great call. Um, these are the kind of things that hey, you don't know who's going to pan out and going to end up being one of those guys that you end up being able to use. Um, and I also honestly. Kenny Stills is a non-zero chance of being, you know, what if they, I brought up, uh, you hear a ton of people talking about some of these different guys in the draft. Kadarius Tony out of Florida is a guy playing tonight, or not playing tonight because I think he opted out for the draft. Um, that is the Isaiah McKenzie, Andre Roberts, single person, uh, you know, replacement. What if you got one of them that can be the gadget guy, the return guy, and then you could sign a Kenny Stills as a fourth receiver, fifth receiver? So um, I think it's not crazy that they're also getting a you know a little bit of a window to check for these guys for next year. So one of the next things we want to talk about, you know, obviously, Aaron, you or I are more people who like to watch the game on TV and have our screens available to us, but there's some people who very passionately love to attend the games. Um, I'm really, really happy for them. It was formally announced today the Buffalo Bills will have uh, fans in the stands for the playoffs. I'm really excited for the people that care about that passionately and that they're going to be able to go. There's a whole list of things that I'm actually pretty happy about the structure they put together. Um, It's for season ticket holders only. You cannot try transfer or sell the tickets on the secondary market. People are going to try to gouge it for $700 playoff tickets and stuff like that. This is going to be ranked by the highest tenured, longest serving fans of people who have gone through all the droughts and all the pain and all the misery are going to be the first ones rewarded with this. Um, You do have to show a uh, negative COVID test to be able to enter. And that was reported. That's the first professional sports arena that is going to require that. So they're going to do the full testing and contact tracing after So this is kind of a pilot model of what they're testing out of how to do other maybe concerts and other venue things. And (laughs) um, so Nick is uh, brought this up that he will actually pay you $700. Um, I put up a tweet joking that there are so many phone calls going on now to season ticket holders about, you know, Hey, I'll I'll snow blow your driveway for a month or, Hey, you know, I didn't really mean when I said a Thanksgiving, right? (laughs) All those things are going on right now. So I know it's not necessarily your or mine alley to, to go, to but i know a lot of people in our lives who are excited about this news yeah and i love going to games don't get it twisted i i love it i go to i was a season ticket holder for a few years and even when i'm not i try to get to two to three games a year usually in september when the weather's a little bit nicer and uh things are a little bit more exciting i'm happy for the people that are gonna get to go i it was a slow news day kind of i think uh with this matchup not really mattering i don't know i'm not i don't particularly care if there's six thousand people at the stadium or not i think we talked about it a little bit it's more of a sort of a gesture 
yeah. to the fans than it is, you know, bringing energy into a stadium. I don't think 6,000 people is going to make a difference for the game itself. I, I, I know the, the players are excited to have real human beings yeah. at the game. I think that's cool. They they all got on Twitter and, and talked about their excitement. So I'm happy for people. I'm happy for the players. I'm happy for fans that are going to get to go. Um, just not it, it's not a thing that moves the needle for me personally. The thing that moves the needle the most for me is I'm a New York resident. I'm up here in Buffalo. If this is successful and people abide by the rules yeah. and do everything the right way and this goes smoothly, this is something like this coming spring and summer. We might be able to get stuff like concerts back, yeah. festival type things, limited capacity, but still get some normalcy of life. And that's super cool. Uh, even next year when football rolls around, if the vaccine isn't fully out, then they will probably increase the capacity and start getting more fans into the stadium uh, next year when this rolls around. So that's really probably what I'm most interested in is, uh, and I do agree, it's, it seems like a, a you know, first of its kind setup in the nation. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's important. And so that's really what I'm going to keep track of is I want to see how it rolls, how, how the rollout goes, how it works, uh, see if it's successful. And it's cool. I don't know. I think one cool thing, you know, I'm glad old season ticket holders are going to be able to get it. I think it would have been cool to donate some of the tickets to sure. first responders, first responders, frontline workers, healthcare yeah. workers, and find a way. Maybe you know, I don't know how strict that number was, but find a way to maybe get players' families uh, sure. into the stadium for this. I think that they've, you know, I know they're all a lot of millionaires and things like that. So <laughs> it's hard to talk about their it's suffering, a, but it's a relative I, scale of suffering, yeah, but it's but still their sacrifice. Their, yeah, there's a lot of sacrifice going on for them to a lot of these players haven't seen their family really at all this year to either live out of state and travel has been interrupted. So it would have been a nice gesture to maybe take that number of season ticket holders and then buffer it for some of the players, yeah. families to get to experience this, a, a family like Jerry Hughes, who's been here for so long and hasn't had a home playoff game. That would have been super cool uh, stuff like that. I think they could have found a way to add some more of the empathetic nature to yeah. allowing fans in. And I even think there's a little, maybe a little pushback on, on the oh, idea. Players, I, families, I, Celeste is saying players, families do get 570. Yeah. That seems like a lot of tickets. Um, I think there's for staff, medical personnel, oh, okay. uh, team officials. I think that there's some allotment from, from that standpoint. Well, then, um, yeah, I and, and I think, <laughs> well, obviously going from 70,000 seats down to 6,700 is a huge difference. You're talking ten percent of the of the people involved. I I do think there's a little energy that comes from that. I, having going from no personal reaction to now having a personal reaction, like when you score and now don't get me wrong, sixty seven hundred people cheering isn't the same as seventy thousand people cheering. But having people immediately react is a thing, and, and I think the guys especially who have had that their entire lives or certainly their entire career for major college and pro. Um, I think there is a little something to that from an energy standpoint. So I actually hope it's not too much juice for Josh. I think that the, I, I've actually had that conversation with a couple of people that not having anyone in the stands might have been a good thing for Josh Allen to be able to kind of calm and tone it down a little bit and right. not, not get that sugar high Josh thing going. So we'll see how it pans out. But I certainly know a lot of people that we're friends with and that are in our lives are very passionate about this. I know several season ticket holders that I have conversations with today asking me all kinds of questions about, hey, where until they got the email that was spelling it out, trying to scramble, like, oh, where do I fall in the seniority list and trying to figure out who to call. So I'm really excited for the fact that I think this is something positive in that it's a shame that the best season in 25 years we haven't had the full capacity and everyone there, and this is at least a step in that direction. So I'm certainly happy for the people that this is uh, a nice bonus for. What I really hope is not, I'm not worried about the people that are going to get to go. I think people are going to go or are going to take it, the responsibility. I don't think they're going to take it lightly. I think they yeah. know what it means. To people. But one of my concerns is people – taking that small inch that it's opening up and going and tailgating and, yeah. and throwing flash tailgates and stuff like that. So if any of you are thinking about it and listening, please don't uh, just let the people that have tickets go and, and enjoy it and go home and watch like we've been doing all season. Don't ruin it for everybody else because there might be more home playoff games regardless of seating. And there's going to be sure hope so. for people to, to go to another game, but not if you ruin it for everybody. 
yeah. So we'll see where that ends up. I'm looking forward to it and um, at least happy that, that there's a possibility now. Sure. Um, speaking to those possibilities, um, you know how in the Matrix, like when Neo finally gets to the point where he can see the ones and the zeros and he could just see everything going on in the Matrix? Yeah. That's the way my brain is now with the playoff simulator. You I've played like lists. You I've like played with out. with so many different things that now when people are like, "Oh, well, what does it mean if Cleveland wins but Pittsburgh doesn't win?" I'm like, "Oh, that means the Bills play Cleveland. They'd be the number two seed. They'd be seven seed." I've played with so many stupid scenarios for this thing. Um, the by far the most likely scenarios for the Bills are going to be. It, it seems like the Bills are going to host Cleveland. I mean, that seems like pretty significantly the most likely scenario. If um, and I will root for it. If the Bills backups can beat Miami, which would be funny, um, we would host Indianapolis in most scenarios. Um, so I, I went through and and you know I'm gonna plan it as though Indianapolis doesn't lose to Jacksonville. I don't see, um, you know, with everyone being pulled, I don't see the Ravens losing to Cincinnati. The couple that I've toggled, I think it's possible that Houston beats Tennessee. I don't think it's likely, but I think it's it's possible. I think, obviously, it's likely that Cleveland wins against Pittsburgh, even though Pittsburgh's pulling their starters. It's possible that Pittsburgh could win. And I think it's likely that the Bills sit a great deal of our starters and that Miami wins this game that they care a lot about while we're sitting our starters. So, But toggling back with those, I think the most likely scenarios are the Bills probably play Cleveland. I don't see a ton of scenarios where the Bills play Baltimore. Um, it would be if Pittsburgh won and uh, Miami won, the Bills would drop to the three seed and would play Baltimore. So for the most parts, it's the Bills are either going to play Miami, Indianapolis, or Cleveland. And in most of the likely scenarios, it's Cleveland. So um, I know people have asked you and I both a ton, you know, do you have a preferred order? Do you have, you know, are we going to try to make a decision based on who we're trying to play? I just don't think that's likely. I just don't think that's what... McDermott's going to be looking for. I think that he coaches every single game he does to win. I think he's going to play the people that, you know, he's going to sit as many people as he possibly can. He's going to go through practice reps. I think they value keeping some level of chemistry and momentum and going through the practice reps, going through the game warm ups, keeping in the same routine and rhythm, getting a driver two, like we saw last year against the Jets. You know, give him a driver two. I don't think they'd hate giving Josh Allen 40 passing yards to break the team record, uh, see if he could do that in the first drive or two, then sit everybody down and, and get the well-deserved rest. So first, do you see anything different than that in the likelihood of who plays and who doesn't play? And then do you have a strong preference in who the Bills play in the first round? Uh, so first, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I would prefer if there's a number of our key players that didn't play at all. I would not. I, I get the record stuff, and I think they will. I, I agree with you. They. I think it'll trend in the direction of a series or two. I'd prefer it not to. There's nothing, in my opinion, to go out and play for. I think they've already captured momentum. I think they've already. I think they're gonna pretty much be in the two seed. I don't care if they get the three seed. Uh, it, it makes no difference to me personally. So I would love to see guys like Allen, Diggs, Mitch Morse. I, I, I don't want him out there. I mean, he's just another hit to the helmet away from a concussion. Jordan Poyer. Poyer would be another one. Uh, Jerry Hughes. He's older and, and has earned that right to have a, a day where he sits. I wouldn't mind if both the linebackers said the, the year Milano's had, I don't want to risk him being out there. I need those guys. Uh, Trey White. I do not want to see him out. You know, guys like that, I would be fine if they – keep them active go through the or you know keep them going through the the normal process but you're not gonna be able to sit everybody so we we understand that you're gonna have to play some of these guys but i would prefer if we didn't see series of those guys but i agree i do think you will i think that's just sean mcdermott but i also think that he is even when the backups come in whenever that is he's coaching to win this game and you 100%. Can, even at the end of that new england game when the backs in uh, I forget who it was made a catch, and he's on the sideline pointing to the spot to make sure that the refs see that they. And there, the game was well in hand. He could have just been hanging out, you know, sipping Gatorade, talking about how great the team is. But he was still intense, ready, 
trying to get those teachable moments for these other young guys. I think this is probably really exciting to the coaching staff, to be honest, because he had no preseason this year for a lot of these bottom of the roster guys to get real playing time. This is almost like in college when you get freshmen a chance to get out there and play because you're building that future. This is the first opportunity for some of the guys to really get meaningful minutes in a real game. And it matters a lot to the other team. Miami is going to be coming out there, giving it everything. Oh yeah. And that's a little bit what scares me about having starters out there and having a guy like Josh, like I think, I don't think Miami can beat our starters. I, I, I feel pretty confident with the way they're rolling, but they're going to try and they're going to give everything. I hate playing against desperate teams. That's when stuff <laughs> that I don't like happens. Um, so I, I'd rather them not play, but I agree with you that I think we'll see some. Uh, but then in terms of simulators and uh, who we play and stuff like that, I've done zero simulators. <laughs> I really don't care. I don't care who we play. I, I don't care about the seating. I will play anyone anywhere i have so much confidence in this team right now in all three phases of the game i think all teams in the afc are good every team that we're going to see potentially in the playoffs is a good team with uh things matchups that don't look great on paper for the bills and matchups that we can exploit yeah. all of them. and i have enough confidence in this team and the staff to find the things they can exploit and, and do it they i haven't seen a team over the last month and a half that's been able to slow down when the bills pinpoint something to go after uh and, and be able to stop them on offer we can hang 30 points on anyone and, and the bills can hold anyone under 20 points that's a recipe where i feel confident i don't care who we play or where it is yeah and you know there's no bears or uh, Washington football team or Eagles in the, the AFC slipping into the playoffs. Yeah. yeah, the Cowboys aren't slipping into the AFC playoffs. There are some teams in the in the NFC where there are some easy first round matchups. There are no easy first round matchups in the AFC. We're going to have a ten and six or eleven and five team that doesn't make the playoffs. The Colts might go eleven and five and not make the playoffs. So there's no easy matchup. You know. I, I think Jason brings up a good point. I think some of the good run defense, good run teams are a little bit of a concern, but the Ravens, Titans, and Browns also have pretty horrible pass defenses, and I think the Bills can hang a ton of points on any of them. Now, if any of those three, and the Colts, throw the Colts in there too, if they get a positive game script and some weird turnovers and get a lead and start to lean on that lead with a running game, sure, it's going to be a pain and it's going to be a difficult game to come back. And I still think the Bills could come back. So um, I'm just not concerned with it. A couple of people in the chat did bring up some things. I don't want to misinterpret that with do I not care about the two seed. I actually do care a little bit about the two seed. I like the idea of hosting both playoff games. I like the idea of hosting the AFC Championship game if the Chiefs get upset. However, I think, and a couple other folks in the chat were talking about this as well, I think there's a chance that they could play, kind of be doing some side scoreboard watching. And right now, they've already reported Ben Roethlisberger is not going to play for the Steelers. It's not going to be just Ben. If they're going to have other guys. If the Browns are up, you know, 17 to three late in the second quarter, we can kind of take our foot off the gas because we have the n number two seed locked up anyways. So I think they're going to do a little bit of scoreboard watching. I don't think it's enough that they would keep Josh Allen or other key, you know, Stefan Diggs, you know, key top Trey white are very premier level guys in the game anyways, but maybe there's a couple guys that play a little bit more and they try to make sure that we, that we go well. I do think there could be some aggression in the opening series or two to try to get two touchdown drives going right off the bat and to try to go and, and get a little bit of a lead and then hand it off to Matt Barkley, try to establish the run, get some of those things going and lean on it that way. So I wouldn't mind establishing and, and taking the two seed, but I don't think it's worth risking for anyone who is now yelling at me, listening, being, no, we should try to win and we should try to go. How did you feel watching Matt Barkley throw to Cole Beasley up 38 to nine and then watching him hold his knee as he went off the field? Cause that was unnecessary. Like I, I think that's reasonable to question why he was still in the game. And if that was avoidable, how would you feel if you saw a key player playing in this game that doesn't actually matter and then we lost someone who is a key figure in our playoff run because we wanted to keep momentum going or we wanted to make sure we got the two seed? You know, it's just the risk is not worth the reward. So I'm greedy. I want both things. I want the two seed and I want to rest everybody. The good news is that's actually possible. 
I I don't know if I'll, I can see McDermott as a scoreboard watcher. I think he's going to go into this game with a plan, and whatever that plan is, he's going to stick with it. And I think he, he probably feels like, hey, if we're putting out a number of these backups, that we can still win again, that we're going to coach to win and, and, and try to win that game. My reason, the reason I don't care about the 2C is I, I'm not scared of Pittsburgh Steelers in any possible way. I'm not sure that they get out of the first round. I, I think it's unlikely. Yeah. Although, uh, to be fair, they did just come back and beat the Colts. I think the Colts are a good team, and they so I think they showed that more life. Was, they showed more life this week than they had for about four weeks. The, but when you watch that game, that was two limp arm quarterbacks, <laughs> honestly throwing ducks deep, and whoever caught the most ducks won yeah. that game in the end. And that was a sloppy game. I don't think it's a, a who each of those teams are, but I, I felt bad watching both those quarterbacks, thinking, man. It's crazy how arms deteriorate like that because Rivers had moments where he, his arm looked like might be back. It's a great example of this year. How do you think Rams fans feel about why? Yeah. Not that not that they were in the situation where they could have pulled back. They needed to win that they game. To go for but him. now all of a sudden their playoff hopes fall on John Wolford <laughs> to Never. make the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know, man. I, it's, so the the three seed thing doesn't bother me. I, even if the Steelers get past the first round, I don't think that they. I think the Bills can go into Pittsburgh and stomp them if they yeah. have to. And if the, it's the Steelers are out of the way, or the, then you basically have the two seed again once the Steelers are out. So it, two seed, three seed. That's why for me it doesn't make a ton of. I'm not scared of the Steelers. I'm not scared to go to Pittsburgh and play the Steelers. I'm not scared of them in any way. I, I feel like that's a great matchup for the Bills, and I think that the way the bills are trending and the way the Steelers are trending heading into the playoffs matter. And so when you eliminate that, it's essentially a tied two seed in my opinion, no matter how this shakes out. Yeah. And yeah, I think that you look at the odds, I think a two or a three seed stand on the opposite side of the bracket of the chiefs. I, th- I like getting the chiefs after three games, not early sure. on. Um, I, I like the idea of hosting playoff games. I think there's still a benefit there. You know, having a little bit of fans in the stands increases that even a little bit more. Um, so I like those different scenarios as you play with it here. I think it's like 40, 45% plus that we're going to play the Browns. Um, the next ones are split between different scenarios for the dolphins, the Titans and the Colts. And, you know, as we said, there's no NFC gimme here, so it's, it's going to be a tough matchup either way. Any of them, I think you've brought it up well. Are you more afraid of Lamar Jackson or are you more afraid of Miles Garrett? Are you more afraid of Derrick Henry or are you more afraid of you know Minka Fitzpatrick? There, there's strengths and weaknesses for each of these teams. Some pockets on defense, some pockets on offense. There are no teams as complete as the Buffalo Bills. You know The Buffalo Bills have the best offense of any of those teams and one of the best defenses of any of those teams playing and right special now. Teams. It, yes, special and teams probably special. the best special teams of any yeah, of those and teams. Maybe right now. outside Andy Reid, the best coaching staff. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that combination, being able to see all those different things, I don't think for, all, all fans should be hoping for coming out of this game is a clean bill of health. Is that everybody comes out healthy? That you know, obviously, I'm going to be rooting for a win. Uh, yeah. You know, because I want the Bills to win every single game. And I think it's funny if our backups beat <laughs> their starters while they're trying to play. But all I care about is a clean bill of health. And then, honestly, I might be doing as much scoreboard watching and watching other games from a scouting perspective as I do watching the Bills backups in this game. I'm certainly going to have multiple TVs going. I just said that when we were getting ready to go live. Like, I really don't care uh, if it, if it goes the way I think it goes or hoping that it goes where we really don't even see any of these guys i'm going to be on red zone most of the day and i'll have the bills game on too but i won't care i'm going to be on red zone seeing how everything else shakes out and i think there's going to be some interesting football uh this weekend but i don't think it's going to be in the miami buffalo game (laughs) yeah yeah i I, don't get me wrong i I watch every bills game i'm going to have it on a screen in my home the entire time i'm probably going to have red zone on another tv and I, i can't promise my eyes won't shift that way several times during the game um so as we go through here, our friends over at West Her, make sure you're checking them out. 23 dealerships in New York State and in the largest dealership group. If you're looking for a vehicle, you know, as you're talking numbers, these are some of the numbers we're talking here. And, and I think that being able to look and, and be in a position that Brandon Bean 
Levine and Sean McDermott and Josh Allen of this team has put us in. This is a lot of fun to be able to go through. And now we get a stress-free weekend to be able to just kind of watch and let other teams stress. And I'm friends with a lot of Browns fans. I'm friends with actually a weird amount of Dolphins fans. Um, and being able to go through and, and how freaked out they are. All the people from the Ravens fan base who are tweeting at me getting mad that the Bills and the Steelers are going to sit players because there's a chance they might miss out on the playoffs if all those things happen. Um, it's really funny how all those things are going. So I certainly am hopeful that we're going to be able to see some you know, fun and exciting football, but I, I'm looking for a clean bill of health and those different playoff scenarios and percentages and probabilities are, are I'm glad those are the only numbers I need to worry about this weekend. Yeah, and I think I'm with you on that. It's been fun to sit back and gloat for the past couple of weeks. That We've talked about it here that the gloating time is fun and get into it, but it's over soon. This is it. Yeah. This is the last week to gloat and have fun because of the playoffs and it's a brand new season and everything starts over. So no matter how these numbers and probabilities and all that shake out, the record ends after this week, they go back to being zero and zero. This is a whole new season and, and a whole new style of football comes into play a lot of the time. So get your gloating. The number you got to get to is a hundred and in a hundred percent gloat for the rest of this week that your teams had a really great regular season. We've seen it before though. Teams that have great regular seasons fall flat in the play. Baltimore last year. Yeah. Absolutely. Baltimore last year had an all time uh, regular season, one of the highest um, point differentials in league history, and we're one and done. Yep. And, and then nobody remembers how good of a season they had last year. Absolutely. And that is exactly what we don't want to see. So Perfect. gloat now, have fun with it because it's, it's a whole new season starting up. Uh, and, and then some different numbers. We'll be talking some different numbers uh, when we head into the playoffs. Uh, this is, I've pounded the table here for Trent Murphy quite a bit on this show, and he, he's done for yeah. on this team. But this is a great opportunity for guys like that uh, in, in a game like this to go out there and have an opportunity to showcase anything. So I think you're going to see guys playing hard. This is not going to be just a gimme for Miami. To and the Bills out. have built impressive depth. Like just because yeah. they're playing their backups doesn't mean this is, we have great offensive line depth and great defensive line depth. For sure. When you have good offensive and defensive line, that means you can stay in game. So heck, we're probably going to have to play be starting on other teams. He's yes. going to get a lot of run in this game. Ryan Bates is a good versatile backup. Ike Bakker is probably going to have to play in this game. <laughs> Maybe Ryan Bates is good. I don't know if Ryan Bates is good yet. Um, but yeah, no, Daryl Johnson, some of yeah. these young guys, you're going to see a lot of them. You're, I mean, you're still going to see Lee by Wallace and Josh Norman. Probably both. Game. We don't have a ton of, you know, you can sit Trey and, and Taron Johnson, but we don't have a ton of extras. Aaron. Like, I, I, I think Trey's probably the only one that goes that. So you're going to see talent yeah. in this game. And it's not going to be, even when if they go with the backups, this is not going to be some uh, just easy, breezy game for the Miami Dolphins. They're still going to have to play to win this game. They might need fits to win this game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe some fits, fits magic or fits tragic. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. But heck, even looking at the the safeties, having guys like Dean Marlowe and Jaquan Johnson, that's a nice safety duo. Like that's not bad. So they're gonna have some some good guys to be able to have fun with. All right, as we pivot over here and talk about our our Uncle Jumbo's player spotlight, it's you know I I think that one of the situations that people have brought up here, we don't know the exact situation with Cole Beasley. Right. Um, so the couple things we know, I mean, obviously I've talked to, to Kyle Trimble, uh, who runs banged up bills. I've looked at several different things. Um, they did do a structural test, uh, an ACL test on the sideline. So it's not a major or serious or what would in the middle of the season be a season ending injury. It's not that kind of thing. It's bad enough that it's a thing, you know, Sean McDermott says week to week. I want to temper that by saying, Sean McDermott doesn't benefit by disclosing or sharing any information now. It's in his best interest for our playoff opponent to think that Sean Mc or that Cole Beasley is not going to be able to play. So I don't, I, I don't put a great deal of stock in that, or even as much as I do earlier in the season, where I try to interpret McDermott ease of day to day versus week to week. Um, I listened to Josh Allen's presser. Josh sounded a lot more optimistic as though he was making comments about that trying to get back this week that Cole Beasley yeah. would be back for Miami and that they wouldn't need him to and so I don't know I, I'm going to read into that a little bit um 
I don't think that there's some doom and gloom scenario here where what most people I saw on Twitter tied to the Kenny Stills news that Cole Beasley was now done or that it was some terrible injury. Some people literally just quote tweeted that and said Cole Beasley with a crying Oh, you should have seen my mentions when I said don't speculate. People are like, how dare you? (laughs) How can you not connect these dots? Yeah, yeah. How can you Uh, not see this? So, um... As they went through there, he did walk to the locker room. It was a slow walk. Um, I do think that there's a legitimate, it looked like an LCL or MCL sprain. It looked like something that, you know, in a week or two, I think two weeks of, you know, now you get into all the crazy fancy, um, you know, cryogenic chamber stuff that they've put into One Bill's Drive in that health and wellness center. All that stuff's going to pay off because he's going to get every single ounce of rehabilitation support that he can get over the next two weeks. We don't, he does not need any extra practice reps. They don't need him running through anything. They can have him on ice for 14 days, right up until, or 13 days, right up until the next playoff game. Um, and I think it's still more likely than not that he's available. And I also think that if they need to play that game, I don't think we can go on the run that people want without a full complement of players, but I think they could band-aid it together for a game with Andre Roberts and Isaiah McKenzie and maybe Kenny Stills and Gabe Davis, along with obviously Stefan Diggs. Um, I think they could band-aid it together for a game if they needed to, but they need Colby Z for this run. He is a critical piece, especially anytime somebody goes to to zone against us. No, for sure. I think, you brought up a great point of the facility at yeah. one bill's drive. And, and that is why you invest in something like that is a crunch time scenario like this, where you need players to recover in season. I think worst case scenario is he plays hurt, you know, a little bit. I think no matter where, where he's at, when he recovers, he's going to be not at a hundred percent. And I think yeah. we saw this with Josh Allen. I believe that he was wearing that knee brace up until last week. I think he, there's a good chance we didn't ever get exact what the injury was. Sean McDermott does not tell us what but the some degree was. of sprain was very likely. Yeah. I'm sure there was some sprain going on. And with the way the uh, facility is uh, of being able to rehab after games and get all the treatments and all the state of the art treatments, plus the drugs they give these guys, let's not act like I, I'm not kidding. Like, yeah. uh, you know, I know that there was that run of the NFL where drugs were just being handed out like candy, but still the injections that these guys can get to play through injury, they're real and they work. And when you get into this one and done scenario, yeah. players are willing to take those injections and just get through it and see what happens because this might be Cole Beasley's last chance to make something serious impact in a playoff game. And he knows that. And so I think any scenario where he can play, he's going to, uh, in that wild card game, if he doesn't, it's, it's not the end of the world. Like you said, I, I think that they can get through a game. Yeah. We all thought it was going to be the end of the world when John Brown went out and the offense just kept getting better. Cole Beasley and John Brown aren't the same. Yeah. I get it. They, they provide different uh, things to this team, but you are getting John Brown back by all estimates. He was going to play. Uh, for that New England game, the team talked about how excited they were that he was coming back to play. And then the COVID close contact happened and prevented him from playing. So you're going to get him back. And that brings a different layer to the offense if Cole Beasley can't go. So I think he's going to be able to go. Um, I, to what extent is, is he going to be injured going into the playoffs? I don't know. But uh, 70% Cole Beasley is better than a no Cole Beasley. Yeah, and, and like they, with the combination of whatever pharmaceutical support that he gets and a knee brace and him just gutting it out for a game, he's still pretty freaking good. Yeah, and maybe <laughs> a uh, pitch count. Maybe it's they yeah. they have him in some type of limited capacity where they just you got to keep the chains moving, and that's when you bring Beasley in. Yeah. Uh, several folks here asking about John Brown. Um, I am under the impression John Brown is one hundred percent ready. Oh yeah, he was activated to the active roster, and then. Simply because he wasn't active and was kind of hanging out with the practice squad guys, Ty, or, uh, TJ Yeldon came down with COVID and, and got was COVID positive. So him and uh, Antonio Williams and yeah, there there was a few practice there yeah. practice squad guys and John Brown were close contacts to TJ yeah. Yeldon. So it's only it's it was so weird the fact that he was. 
you know, injured, he'd technically get close contact to TJ Will TJ Yeldon. Um, but he was activated and now was you, ready to play in the game on been Sunday. Tested daily since. Yes. I think some people thought the Steel Stills thing was maybe bad news about John Brown. Yeah. It doesn't appear he's Correct. been tight. we would hear about some type of positive he would go. It would have been on the same four four PM news release uh that you had the Browns player who was right. listed. We would have found out if there was an issue with that. So right. um I am under the impression John Brown is as close to one hundred percent as any NFL player is now, this which kind of year. The answer is zero. No player is actually 100%. This is a 100% injury league. It's an attrition league. Um, but he's as ready to play as any other player is I right now and ready to go. Diggs or maybe Allen in the postgame presser where they said they were super excited for John Brown to get back out on the field. Like it was the team knew John Brown was going to play yes. in that Patriots game. And then the news came out. So Correct. the fact that he was going to play in that Patriots game tells me he's, he's good to go going yeah. forward. Um, and then I know a couple of people might have joined the show late here asking about uh, Kenny Stills. My impression is he has to pass the COVID protocol this week. Yeah. He would be eligible to practice next week and eligible to play in the playoff game. So he's no matter what, he's not going to be eligible to play in the Miami game. The fact that he was tweeting out pictures of him in a Bills jersey and of celebrating with Bills fans... I'm pretty sure that gives you an indication that this is just a formality of him going through the protocol and he's going to sign with the Bills next Monday or Tuesday when he's eligible. But he's technically not eligible until he passes protocol and then they can announce it. So um, Adam Schefter didn't break that news. And then Kenny Stills retweeting pictures of him in a Bills jersey because he's not going to sign. So I think it's just a formality. Schefter's tweet at the end to seem to – I forget exactly what it said, but it essentially said something like in both sides – like it, it essentially is probably going to get done Correct. here. And I think in a COVID year, visiting with the team is essentially Correct. like you're not bouncing around visiting teams. They don't go for random workouts like they used to. Exactly. So if you've made the point to visit with the team, you're, you're pretty much, especially going into the playoffs here, you're committing to that. In yeah. my opinion, that's total speculation, but that, that's where I, my head was at with all the news today. So a couple things for this game itself. A good question from Steve here with Yeldon out this week, which he is still going to be in that. He tested right. COVID positive. That's a minimum of, I think it's 10 days. It might be 15 now. Back in back in November, they changed some of the rules. It used to be a five-day waiting period. Now it's six. They changed if you were positive. There was an, a longer period of time, so I apologize. They may have changed that from 10 days to 15 days. Um so I'll put you on the spot here, Aaron. I didn't ask you to prep for this. Um, are there any other players that we haven't seen this year that you're maybe excited to see a couple snaps from this weekend? I've seen Antonio Williams. I've seen people mention Dane Jackson, uh, Tyler Croft. You, you mentioned Trent Murphy. Any other players that haven't gotten a ton of run that you're maybe looking forward to seeing a little bit of extended snaps? Yeah, I mean, I not really. Like, I don't know. Like, Antonio Williams doesn't do any move the needle <laughs> for me in any way uh i guess it would be nice to see croft a little bit more obviously we're we're not going to see reggie gilliam it would have been nice to see a reggie gilliam tight end one afternoon where to see what he can do at, i would like that one yeah in, in that position we're not going to get to see that um yeah i don't know some of the i think it'd be good to get another good look at ty and Seki. Uh, sure. going forward here to see what he's got. Ryan Bates is a guy. I, that I, Ryan Bates is on. one I had. Yeah, yeah, that's a guy I'm not particularly sold on. I'd like to see what he can do. This is a good defensive front seven. So yep. to, to Jaquan see Johnson happen. is a guy I'd like to see. We we only I'm saw really basically good, yeah. this game last year. Fans uh, are always telling me he's good, and I have no <laughs> idea. I don't. I don't have any idea. People are always hitting me up like, "Oh yeah, Jaquan Johnson's going to be the man." I'd love to find out. That's a position. That's a sneaky position as we do approach the off season. Of what do we do beyond Jordan? Porter Just age wise, yeah. That's starting yeah. to get to that point. And if he's not the guy, they got to find a guy late in a draft or, or find another guy somewhere to develop because now's the time to develop that next guy in line. So it'd be good to, yeah, I think Jaquan Johnson's a good one. Sarah Neal getting some run yep. at cornerback. I want to see that. I've been high on him. He hasn't really stepped up to where I thought he could be. He stepped at great special teams, uh, but I would like to see a little bit more run. Uh, but yeah, Dane Daryl Dar Dar Johnson. Yeah, I, I'm pretty good on Daryl Johnson though. I like <laughs> I like him. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. I was low on him going into the season. I love what I've seen out of him. Yeah, but Johnson, Epinesa, I'd love for them to just go ball out and, and see what they've really got and, and tee it up. So yeah, this maybe uh, one team, man. 
one you brought up earlier, I, I don't hate the idea of seeing a whole game of Isaiah McKenzie play an actual receiver and not just sure. gadget guy. That's going to be interesting to see. I think he gets a shot to do that, honestly. I think he'll get a fair amount of run there. Same idea with Andre Roberts. Isaiah McKenzie I think. a cornerback? <laughs> I mean, he's maybe he'll take a new position. We haven't seen him at linebacker. Maybe he gets some reps at linebacker or, or line him up the heck in the backfield, the tailback. Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's going to be fun. Um, Lone Wolf brings up a, a great point here. We're going to have to watch Brian Winters play. So, you know, condolences for for having to watch that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting. And, and honestly, it's really fun that that's what we get to look forward to in this game is that, oh, this is kind of neat. I get to watch this player that I was excited about in the preseason play. Um, so, you know, for all the Dolphins fans who have to, you know, actually care about this game and, and be nervous of whether you can beat the Bills backups, you know, best of luck. I, I hope it goes well for you and that the Bills backups don't accidentally beat your team when they're trying their hardest because that would be a real shame. Another kind of sneaky one that I wouldn't mind seeing some play from is Dave Sweat. I wouldn't oh, mind if he was yeah. active and able to get some snaps uh they the table spoke highly of him this yep. week and i think that the team even just activating him was just a nod to the hard yeah. work that he does off the field and you know there's a there's another scenario where i don't think i think if josh allen goes down no matter what the season's over Correct. Uh, but there's we do a not have a guy who can carry that also sure. don't want matt barkley to go down yeah Right, like there, there's a well, and there's even you don't a, want him to wear out and play. There's a post Matt Barkley world that you know maybe they're interested. Maybe the three quarterbacks next year, Matt Barkley's not on the roster next year under contract. I think the post Matt Barkley world is next year. Yeah, maybe that's Jake Fromm and Davis Webb. Maybe we have the three quarterbacks that that they think and that. Um, you know, Matt Barkley is actually a couple years older, you know, so being able to to look at that and what we have from from someone like Davis Webb, who, you know, is uh, kind of a surprising 25 in that, you know, um, it, it's something that maybe that is something they're intrigued by. Um, I know a lot of people asked about Jake Fromm. I as far as I understand, the, the whole point of what they've been doing is keeping him kind of quarantined away from it. I did see a picture of him with the other quarterbacks after the Denver game with masks on. So I don't know exactly to what extent. I know guys like think- Sal and our friends have said he's not taking regular practice reps, but I don't know if he's like completely 100% isolated all the time from the team. So if it's not throwing all the work they've done out the window of having a quarantined COVID break glass in case of COVID quarterback. Um, I would, I wouldn't mind seeing some reps from Jake from. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. He hasn't taken practice reps as far as we know from the media guys, but the way I had heard, it, I don't know which guy I heard it from. He essentially is taking after practice reps with guy. Like he's still okay. in the team facility during the week he's around the team in certain scenarios. I think that during the meetings and stuff, he might be zoomed in. I, I forget where I heard all this stuff, but he's involved. It's not like he's well, it, that would make sense though. totally away. They're just keeping him in the building, but away. Well, and because the outside practice reps, you don't uh, click the trigger for close contact. Correct. Whereas in a meeting room, in the quarterback room, you do, trigger close contact so that would make sense that they could still do some outside reps after practice off hours but not in the quarterback room and that might be the virtual part that he's doing yes but i think he's still in the building just in another room but he's still getting the treatment still lifting and things like that within the bill's facility from what i I heard i i'm not an inside it's kind of fun i had a vision at one point that especially after his tweet surfaced and some of the things that came out that he wasn't the most popular guy in the locker room, I had this vision of them telling him, like, no, 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 you're still on the team. Just stay home. You yeah. you, you don't come around anybody anymore, but don't worry. You're still on the team. It still counts. We're just going to tell everybody it's because of COVID. But, uh, yeah, nobody wants you here, so you just go ahead and stay home. Right. <laughs> Um, obviously Liam brings up by far the most important thing to cheer for this weekend. Um, Corey Bajorquez is only three punts away from qualifying for leading the NFL in punting average. So one, it's really fun that our punter isn't even qualified to be in the average for longest punt. More touchdowns than punts. Yeah, we have more punts. We have more touchdowns than punts. He doesn't even have enough punts to qualify for the average. 
and he's the only guy who's punted for us and been our punter the whole game. So one, that's awesome. It's really fun that we never punt the ball and punt the ball the least of any team in the NFL. But if he's going to punt, I wouldn't mind him leading the league. That's kind of fun. So uh, if he does need to average 2.5 punts per game, um, so he needs to be able to have three more punts. He needs to get up to 40 punts for the year. He has 37 right now. So if he has three punts and they are of any normal average, he doesn't have to have you know, moon shots, uh, he will lead the NFL in longest punt average, uh, gross net gross average punt, uh, for the year. So just kind of a fun little thing to, to be able to, to check out. Um, I'm assuming that without Josh Allen and against the Dolphins defense, three punts is probably within reason that he's going to get on Sunday. Sure. Yeah. If you're into that kind of thing, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm very into that thing. You know, as yeah. the former president, uh, the former estranged and and shamed president of the Corey Borges fan club. See, I, I, I would think it's cooler that. to end the year with him not qualifying. <laughs> I, I like qualifying. it. I like I, it because that just means <laughs> hey, we didn't even have to roll him out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't even know what that's like. Our, our punter doesn't even qualify for the league average. Yeah. Um. So, hey, guys, if you want to shoot in any of the questions here before Aaron and I wrap up, um, Aaron, uh, any other thoughts of, of things you've come across? on Twitter uh, any fun uh, pettiness that you've come across of things that were enjoyable to rub in the face of maybe former friends and, and neighbors in the New England area yeah no I, I poke some fun they're not taking it well uh, <laughs> I, a lot of my friends are just kind of like oh whatever I don't know I don't even care <laughs> whatever man it's like they're so spoiled it's such an entitled spoiled fan base in boston they they don't know how good they've had it where i've sat through 20 years of me- total mediocrity to bad football and that they get one season of a mediocre team. it's not even the worst football no. i've ever seen it's like been mediocre for the most part uh and they can't even deal with it they can't i i it. saw there was an entire topic on a major boston writ the primary sports talk radio network where they were talking about is this rock bottom they're gonna go seven and nine <laughs> you, you people think that seven and nine is rock bottom you yeah. spoiled little brats it's, it's, so, ridiculous. it's so hysterical it's so entitled yeah oh. I, tweet, I put it out on my face because facebook's where most of my fellow uh or not my fellow but all my patriots fans are and i said like where are where have you guys been all year because usually it's i'm seeing all the victory posts oh, yeah. and all the posts and it's been total crickets over uh, on my facebook i haven't seen a thing about football except Except for mine and they're like well we don't have to post after every time we win like you and it's like oh okay yeah I'm sure. <laughs> good one uh yeah they're just total babies they it's an, exactly right here with uh nick saying it, they, they've been insufferable it's an insufferable yeah. fan base across the board red sox Celtics, Bruins. ruins all of them yeah totally insufferable totally spoiled and i wanted to rub it in their face but no outside of that i'm, I'm i gotta say I participated in it a little bit. I'm kind of over, like, we're so good at this point. It's been going on for so long in this season. I'm kind of over the dunking on the Nick Wrights. I'm yeah. kind of over the dragging everybody back. Most people have come around. If you're still not around on the build, you're yeah. just doing it because. Correct. I'm, I'm kind of over that side of the gloating. I'm ready to get into the, hey, now we're a serious football contender. Yeah. And if you're just, if you're still not sold on us, screw you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to put it is that, you know, now it's undeniable. You can't pretend the Bills aren't good now. Now all that matters is can we prove it in the playoffs, and that's what's going to be there. Uh, A couple quick questions to close it out here. Chip asking, um, will Tua or Fitz get the start? I, You know, Brian Flores did officially say Tua is going to start. Um, Obviously, it's not crazy that we could see another relief pitching effort though that setup is weird and i still am very curious of the long-term ramifications of it in the short term it's worked out fine for them they've won games they tried to throw him out there in the denver game to come back and, and get a comeback he you know Ryan Fitzpatrick was Ryan Fitzpatrick and he threw an interception in the end zone because that's what he does half the time and half the time he does what you saw in Oakland or against Las Vegas and he had the miraculous no look pass because he was getting face masks because that's what Fitzmagic does sometimes and sometimes yep. Fitzmagic kind of Fitzmagic um the couple other things here, what do you think would have happened if the Diggs trade had happened at the trade deadline last year I don't want to think about that because that makes me sad about what could have been um 
I, I think it was perfect the way it worked out this year. He had the full off season. I don't know if you asked Stefan Diggs. I don't know that his head was in the right space last year to be ready for that pivot midseason. Um, but I think it's exciting of what could have been in that run last year, having a weapon like there. And you think about that jump ball in the end zone that went to Duke Williams and he, he made his best effort there's a good chance that Stefan Diggs simply creates enough separation that he's open and it didn't need to be a contested catch and that maybe they are able to, to come away with that game. But uh, I certainly am glad that we have him now. Yeah, I've seen the butterfly effect, so I don't do what ifs because <laughs> it always ended up worse for Ashton Kutcher in that movie. Uh, no, but honestly, I think the Bills losing that game was part of the process of what we see now. You look at some of these great teams. Uh, Heck, the team the produced that. video focused on it. Yeah. That wasn't fans. The team produced video. The primary focus was that playoff loss. You look at, uh, uh, you know, I don't think Josh Allen's going to be Michael Jordan, but you look at a great like that and having to go up against the Detroit Pistons and just get beat yeah. in the playoffs and take those hard losses. It hardens you and your team and really it can be if you're the right kind of person you have the right dna and makeup it can be what pushes you to see the success we've seen in josh allen the picture of his face sitting on the bench in that game is what has made this monster that we've seen this year in josh allen and i don't know that I, if you get digs josh allen might not have been ready for a guy like that and it might the chemistry might not have occurred in the way that we see it this year and digs might have said shit like i got traded to this team and this quarterback's not it i don't want to be here either yeah. but we we've seen i think everything happened exactly as it needed to uh to build up where this team is right now and i wouldn't change it for the world yeah uh ron asking here do we know where the special teams rank this season I, i've seen a couple obviously there's different people who do different metrics i've seen them rank second and i've seen them rank fourth in the couple that i've seen so they are near the top for that um, I'll, I'll ask you this one. What do you think is the one thing that could derail a Bills postseason run outside of injury? <sighs> Bad matchups? I mean... That's the beauty. That's the beauty of the NFL, man. Is it's one and done. Like we've seen it with the Jets beating the Browns when they needed to win games. We've seen it. The with Rams. Teams. Yeah. The exactly. The Rams get losing when they needed to win. Yeah. This is the NFL, man. Once you're in the postseason, so many turnover, a fluky turnover can go wrong. I mean, anything at this point can derail it once you're there. Yeah. Uh, I'll say, sure, obviously, injury is the number one, and it's injury to Josh Allen. And the number two is. Sugar high, Josh Allen, is that, that that's the one thing that could derail it is that he gets too juiced up and tries to do too much, doesn't stay within himself, doesn't stay calm. He's played so phenomenally well this year. And the comment I hear from so many other casual fans and like Cleveland fans and Miami fans, people who are not Bills fans or people who used to be Bills fans that are coming back and watching now is how ridiculously calm he is how he doesn't get rattled, how he does, how he stays within himself when he's playing and comes up with these great plays and doesn't go crazy. That's my biggest fear is that he's going to get jacked up and try to do too much. So I don't think that's what's going to happen. I don't predict that. But if you're asking me what's the one thing that could derail a Bill's postseason run besides an injury, it would be him trying to do too much and trying to put it all on his shoulders. I am looking up. So DVOA has the Bills ranked fifth. There you go. Uh, for special teams. So that's football outsiders. DVOA has them as the fifth best special teams overall. Yeah. And I think that's the exact same area that I've seen to, to that point and um, should be, you know, if you look at this season, you know, you're talking about some, a couple weird kicks early in the year for Bass, two of which people argued were actually good. One shanked punt for, uh, you know, Corey Bohork has one muffed punt for Andre Roberts and maybe two or three bad returns. We've given up no major returns all year. I think maybe Miami had one decent one on us. Um, we've given up no huge, no punt returns pretty much all year and have had good coverage in everything that we've done. It's the best all around special teams we've seen in a long, long time. And, and honestly, it should be. We're paying decent money for Andre Roberts. We're paying decent money for Tyler Medikevich. We brought back Taiwan Jones. Saran Neal's really good. Like, we should be good. This is what it should look like when you've invested the time and energy and money in it. Um, but it's great to see that it actually is good uh, to be able to be at that point. Yeah. And Nicholas Lowe asked about DVOA. So while I'm in there, I was oh, looking, uh, they are fifth in offense. 
uh, as well, and they are not top 10 in defense still. They're Although, I don't know if you have it handy there. Does it give the weighted DVOA I have in the view it. you're in? So for weighted defense, real quick, it's nice that my internet works now. Uh, <laughs> For weighted, they're still not top 10. They're 12. Okay. So they're okay. the 13th or 12th. So it co- coming up, and, and I think that's probably accurate. You know, you yeah. look at the... And a lot of it's fluff from the early portion of the season. I think if you... If I went back and sliced it to the last month of football, I think they're a top 10 defense. Yeah. Well, and even then, you think about some of those games, you know, the Seahawks were never really in that game. The Bills were controlling the Seahawks right. the entire game up by two scores. But when you get to the end of it, technically Russell Wilson had 390 passing yards. It looks like a lot. Um, One fluky breakdown on these. Yeah. Guys. Well, heck, it, technically, look at Monday night. We gave up 201 total yards, but some people want to harp on the fact, oh, you gave up 164 rushing yards. Well, they gave up 200 total yards. I don't care that 160 of it was on the ground. They gave up 200 total yards. It's a dominating yeah. performance. 50% of that was three plays. Yes, yes. So it, it's certainly not a, 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 a concern for me. Steve asking here, is the fake punt accounted for in DVOA special teams metrics? I, I don't think so. I think technically a fake punt counts as a passing play, yes. um, and, and it's not recorded in that manner, but it should be because it was awesome. <laughs> I have a prediction to go into the playoffs with. I was going to save it, but now that we're talking about kind of weird plays. The play I think that drives everyone a little bit nuts when the Bills get up to the line and they try to make somebody jump off sides either when it's running down to the two-minute warning or running down to the half or whatever the scenario is or they take a timeout. I think they're going to do that in the playoffs and snap it and get it. They have so much of it on film. You you could hear the Patriots saying they're not going to snap. They're not going to snap over the foot. I think they've been setting up all year long in a key situation, like a third and short, when the time's right. They're going to go up there and just do it, do it, do it, and then snap it and catch somebody. They're going to be like, they're not running it. They're not running it. Yeah. Well, it will set you up. So a good reference for that is that touchdown catch by Josh Allen last year in the first round by the Texans. They set that play up with, with Isaiah McKenzie on that jet sweep over and over and over again. And this time lulled everybody into secure into the false sense of security, flipped it for a, a double reverse pass, and nobody was paying attention to Josh. And I went back and looked. You see him trailing off to the side, trailing off to the side, trailing off to the side. And this time he just turned it into a wheel route straight up the sideline. And that's the kind of thing that he sets up for those kind of things to be able to – when you can produce a guaranteed gimme touchdown in the playoffs, those things are worth their weight in or gold. Even the, the first down, like the playoffs, just a man, big play, a a a, a a a toxic differential play, a toxic differential play, any type of advantage you can get, it's one and done, man. So it, it's things like putting guys, putting Josh Allen in position to run more. And I know fans don't want to see it because he could get injured, but it's in the playoffs. You, in the playoffs, you put everybody body body on the line to win a game because you only get one chance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, uh, this was more fun than we expected uh, going into a game like this. You, um, well, yeah, obviously. Um, so going into this, you know, I hope you guys enjoy this weekend. Check out some of the scoreboard watching. My prediction is Cleveland beats Pittsburgh. My prediction is Miami barely beats our backups and that we still give them a heck of a run um, and that maybe we get a little bit of a lead and can hold on to it. Um, I think that we do end up probably playing Cleveland in the first round, but I don't think it's crazy that the Bills' backups hold on and maybe we end up playing the Colts. I I think those are the two most likely scenarios in my mind. Um, So we'll see where those things go and and certainly root for a fun uh, weekend here. And then we will be here, depending on who that matchup is, to preview a play playoff matchup at home with fans in the stands where the Buffalo Bills are going to be favored and that's awesome and I can't wait and this is going to be such a fun run for everybody Aaron tell the good people where they can find you yeah you can find me at Aaron Quinn 716 and just want to take a minute too because we won't see it until the new year it'll be 2021 so thank you for spending this weird year with us it's been super weird we've got the bills they're good that's been fun but uh, I, I really wish everyone that follows us and is out there nothing but success i hope 2021 rocks i hope we all get to go out and interact with other humans and do cool things and see bills games and uh and hopefully the success of the bills continues into 2021 here uh but i just want to wish everyone a happy new year 
Absolutely. Happy New Year. Wish you all the best. Let all this weirdness of 2020 wash away, and we'll just hold on to the one good thing we've had all year, these Buffalo Bills. This has been the lone bright spot for many of us in a weird, rough year, and now we get to watch them be the good part going into this new good year. So Happy New Year to everyone. Um, For our friends over at Uncle Jumbo's, thank you to them. Thank you to Wester. On behalf of Aaron Quinn and Greg Thompson, you have been listening to Cover One Buffalo, and we are out.